Justice Garman, thank you for joining me today for a conversation about your career just before your retirement. I'm delighted to be interviewed. Well, before we start, I'd like to share that I am filling in for our executive director, Erica Harold, who had hoped to be here today to have this conversation with you, but unfortunately was exposed to COVID. So she asked me to take her spot. Well, I understand, and I've just talked with Erica, and uh, I, I certainly applaud her decision to be very conservative about her approach and stay, stay safe. Absolutely. Now, Justice Garman, you entered law school in the 1960s at a time when there were very few female attorneys and judges. Why did you want to go to law school? Yeah, I wanted to go to law school from the time I was a young kid, uh, probably 15 or 16 years old. And I, I just thought it was a wonderful career. And it, what appealed to me the most was that I thought there's such a d diverse uh, set of options for becoming a lawyer. And you could be a transactional lawyer, you could be a litigator, you could work for a company, you could write books, you could do anything as long as, uh, as long as you wanted to and you were interested in it. So I thought it would give me a myriad of options for a career. I could never, ever have imagined I would end up where I am. <laughs> never. <laughs> You've had quite a career. <laughs> I have. I have. You graduated from law school in 1968 and had trouble finding a job. Can you talk about entering the legal profession as a woman attorney at that time? Well, you, you referenced earlier, there were very few women in law school and very few women in the practice of law. And at that time, really, it was the end of the idea that women had three options. You could be a teacher or a nurse or a secretary. I thought those were honorable professions, but they didn't interest me in, uh, in to pursue for the future. So, uh, you know, I think that there were, for me, it was, it was a step in the right direction. So, um, but there were, there were very few women. And the attitude really was, why are you doing this? Uh, when, I, when I said I was going to law school, uh, people said to me, what's, what's a nice girl like you want to do something like that for? And I would say, well, I really want to be a lawyer. I was dating my husband at the time, and people said to me, well, why don't you go to work and put him through law school? And I said, because I want to be a lawyer. Uh, so, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow through on that. So it was, there was a time when people just couldn't imagine a woman being a lawyer. And then when I was looking for employment, uh, they would say things to me like, well, what would we do with you? Uh, no one wants to talk to a woman lawyer. Uh, no one's going to come in here and share their business concerns and, and interests with, with a woman. And, you know, can you make coffee? Uh, you know, can, we, we don't really need anybody to do research. Others, other firms said, well, your husband's a lawyer. How can you be a lawyer? Uh, wouldn't you feel the need to go home and talk to him about all your cases that you had during the day? And I would say to them, well, not any more than he would feel the need to come home and talk to me about all the things that he was doing. But they just couldn't, couldn't wrap their head around the fact that a woman was a lawyer. And plus the fact that they, a lot of them thought I wasn't serious, that I would stick with it, that I would leave the practice. Uh, all those kinds of attitudes were very prevalent. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you about the, this story. I, I remember, recall reading a story about a law school professor uh, telling you that, asking you why you were yeah. in law school and were you there to catch a husband exactly. and perhaps you should give your seat up to a more deserving male. That was about a direct quote. Uh, those attitudes were very prevalent. And even, I mean, even the administration of the law schools had that kind of an attitude. And that wasn't just at the University of Iowa. That, that existed in law schools throughout the country. How was that being one of the only uh, f females, one of the only women in law school? Well, I always said that when I was in law school, I never wore anything that was bright. I only wore black, brown, gray, uh, something. I tried very hard to not be conspicuous. But of course, I found I was conspicuous anyway because they knew I was there. 
So it, there were some professors that, were, that just ignored uh, the women. Uh, there were other professors that s would single you out to try to embarrass you or to try to, you know, skewer you uh, additionally. Uh, sometimes they would pick out a, a particularly egregious case like a sexual assault or something and, and want you to comment on that, on those kinds of things. Um, but the, the interesting part was that my classmates were very accepting of having women uh, in the class. And so it was, it was as much of a, of a bad thing for them as it was for me. And, and I, I made the decision uh, early on that their words were not going to influence me. I was going to stay, stay with it. And I was fortunate that we graded, they graded my numbers. So they didn't, you didn't have to put your name on the, on the papers. So I always felt that was, a, that was a real advantage. Wow, I, I didn't realize that. Yes. That's fascinating. Yes. So you've broken quite a few glass ceilings throughout your career. Mm -hmm. You were the first woman presiding judge in Vermilion County. Yes. The first, first woman judge in Vermilion County. First woman judge in mm -hmm. Vermilion County. First uh, woman judge on the fourth district appellate court. That's right and the second woman to serve on the Illinois Supreme Court. That is correct. Can you reflect on these accomplishments? Well, I was a, when I was in practice uh, in, here in Vermilion County, uh, when I was an assistant state's attorney, <clears throat> one day one of the, uh, the judges said to me, have you ever thought about becoming a judge? I mean, I was so flattered, but absolutely blown away. And I said, no. And he said, well, you should think about it. He said, you have the right ability to do it, and you have the right temperament to do it, and I think you'd really enjoy it. So that planted that seed, and I re began to think about, hmm, maybe, maybe being a judge would be an interesting uh, part of the profession. So when I, I left the state's attorney's office and went into private practice, but I told the firm that I had, was interested in becoming a judge, and that if, if an, a vacancy uh, occurred, I would, intended to apply. So. Uh, lo and behold, about a year into my private practice, one of the associate judges retired and I applied. I thought, well, the worst thing that can happen is I won't get it and I'm young, so um, I'll make an application. And I did, and uh, on Christmas Eve of 1973, my husband and I and our then two-year-old daughter were on our way to Joliet to spend Christmas with my family when WGN News announced that a woman had been appointed a judge in downstate Illinois. I mean, it was big news at the time. There were only eight women judges in the entire state of Illinois. And I got to be one of them. And that's how you found out? That's how I found out, wow. yes. Wow. Yes. It, was, it was quite a wow moment and probably one of the best Christmases I ever spent. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. What do you think are the biggest challenges facing women attorney and judges today? Well, I think the, the, the biggest challenge, of course, is, is continued acceptance and to be able to do ex all the things you'd really like to do uh, as a practicing attorney. I think certain areas of the law have been, have been opened up government work, for example, the judiciary, there are a number of women judges now uh, that we see in Illinois, and the number is, I think, growing. The number of women in law school is growing. Women professors in law school are growing. Uh, we're seeing that, that aspect really uh, developing. I think there's still a good deal of frustration with women in, pri in the private law firms, the civil law firms. I certainly hear from, uh, from them that they're certainly frustrated with, uh, you know, moving into a meaningful partnership track. And uh, women tend not to practice law the same way that men do. Mm -hmm. And so finding, uh, finding that right balance, I think, is, continues to be a challenge. What do you think law firms and legal organizations can do to better support women? Well, I think give them, give them the opportunity to, to perform and, uh, and, and try to facilitate or uh, make it uh, acceptable or easier for women uh, in the practice and understand that, uh, you know, what the demands may be. Mm -hmm.
When you served as Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court, you created the Illinois Judicial College to elevate continuing education for judges and court staff. What's the importance of continuing education for lawyers and judges? Well, I don't think you can be an effective lawyer or judge unless you continue to keep yourself uh, abreast of the recent developments in the law and also of recent changes in procedures. Uh, we have to learn. You know, if we don't learn, we stagnate. And uh, the law does change. Now, some people think it doesn't change fast enough, but it does change. But I have long been a proponent of continuing education for lawyers and for judges. I was chairman of the, uh, of the Ju Committee on Judicial Education for the, uh, for the court when I was on the, in the circuit court and then when I was on, on the appellate court. And so I always felt that this was so important. And I thought that the judicial education was, was so critical and so demanding that I really thought it needed to be a separate organization with a professional staff that would be totally dedicated to continuing education for judges. Uh, we, we relied on our judges in Illinois to provide the education and training for our other judges. And they do a wonderful job of that, and they still continue to, to teach. But it is a daunting task. There, uh, there's so much to be done and so much to be uh, handled with programming and the like that we, they needed a professional organization and a structure that would allow them to do what they do best, which is teaching, but having a lot of the other matters uh, handled for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you're from Danville in a pretty rural area of eastern Illinois. Um, across the state, we've seen fewer attorneys practicing in rural areas. How is this impacting access to justice, and what should the legal profession be doing to address this? Well, I think the legal profession needs to be strongly aware of this issue. It is a very real issue. Uh, we, just, we don't have lawyer, very many lawyers coming into our communities. We have far more of them leaving, uh, lawyers dying, lawyers retiring, and they're, you know, we're not keeping pace. And there, there are legal problems that need to be determined and be handled by, by attorneys. So I'm very much supportive of the Rural Practice Initiative that the Illinois State Bar Association has, has uh, initiated, and I think that those kinds of programs need to be encouraged and, and expanded. Uh, we need to find more ways to make uh, practice downstate more appealing to uh, lawyers. When I, uh, as a Supreme Court Justice, of course, I have law clerks, and I have, uh, over my career, hi hired recent graduates, uh, uh, two recent graduates, to work in my chambers for uh, two years. And, the re and I have done that f to and try to encourage lawyers to remain in central Illinois, or for sure to remain in Illinois, and to give them that, that experience. And I can say that a number of the clerks that I've had have gone on to successful careers uh, many places, but I, there are quite a number that have stayed in central Illinois, and I'm very proud of that. So you have been uh, praised by your admirers for your wisdom, for your foresight, humility, and calm leadership under pressure. Why are these traits important for lawyers and judges? Well, I think you have to be a very measured uh, person to, to be successful at being a judge because things come at you from all directions. And in the back of the Supreme Court courtroom is a, is a Latin phrase, audi alterum partum, which means to hear both sides. And judges need to do that in all the, th all the activities that they engage in. So you need to be willing to listen and listen to both sides and to give a considered uh, opinion and judgment uh, after you've considered all the facts. So I think, it's, uh, I think that's why it's important. Why is civility and professionalism important in the legal profession? Well, I think that people uh, will, will have more respect for lawyers and for the court system and the judicial branch if they are treated with dignity. And I've always, I've always believed that it's important to treat each of our 
every person that comes into the court with the with fundamental dignity. Uh, we know, we know now through the concept of procedural justice that those people that believe that they've had a fair uh, and impartial hearing obey court orders uh, more readily, and they uh, they believe that they got a fair shake when they went to court. So it is, you know, it it isn't just an idea. It really is of practical importance, and and it's and besides that, it's extraordinarily unpleasant if you're around people that are nasty and and sniping at each other. Uh, you know, when I was in the trial court, and if I had attorneys that that I thought were getting close to the line, I'd tell them, you know. If I wanted, if I wanted to hear arguments, I could go out on the school grounds and listen to the kids argue with each other. But I didn't need that in courtroom, and and they responded accordingly. Have you seen an increase or a decrease? Would you say in civility within um, the court system as a result of COVID nineteen? Well, the people I see, of course, I see, uh, I see the very highest level of professionalism and civility. But I certainly hear, uh, I hear things uh, from the members of the practicing bar that lead me to believe it's a continuing challenge. I don't think your, I don't think your uh, uh, job in the Commission on Professionalism is going to be declared over and done with uh, anytime soon. I think it's a continuing obligation and an important, very important to remind people to perform and uh, at the and live and act at the highest level. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I always tell the, the admittees to the bar that, you know, the rules of professional conduct don't establish the, the, the ideal, they give you the minimum. And if you're going to uh, practice law with uh, dignity and appropriately, you're going to have to live to a higher level and hold yourself to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. It's important to do that. And you've been very involved in our uh, law school orientations, our professionalism orientations at law school. So. Mm -hmm laying the foundation for professionalism in future lawyers really from the start. Well, I think it's important that law students understand from the very first day that they're embarking on a profession and that they're not, uh, you know, they're not just kids anymore. They have an obligation and they might as well start uh, learning how to discharge their obligation while they're in law school in their conduct with their fellow students and their conduct with their professors. and. Uh, with the doc with the uh, pleadings or the uh, documents that they prepare, uh, that's all good practice. So I think it's a, I think it's a really uh, favorable thing. I, I can tell you from uh, I've done the University of Illinois for a number of years, and you know early on I I don't know I thought the attitude maybe was uh, kind of uh, take it or leave it, but I have seen that change uh, dramatically, and the the uh, Law students are very receptive and I think really it makes them proud to be a law student and they should be. Absolutely. So upon announcing your retirement, you recommended Justice Lisa Holder, Holder White fill your role on the Illinois Supreme Court. I did. Justice Holder White will be the first black woman to serve on the Supreme Court. Why did you recommend Justice Holder White? Well, she's eminently well qualified for the position. Uh, she has uh, served at every level of the court as I as I have done. She has uh, extensive practice in the law. She was very involved in judicial education and, and was one of the leaders in the movement to the in Illinois Judicial College. Um, and she is uh, she's a person that I think is very uh, principled. She's the highest level of integrity, and I think the fact that she's the first black woman to serve is just uh, something really special. I'm really delighted that she'll have that, that opportunity to have that first. She deserves it. What are the biggest lessons you've learned throughout your career? Well, I think perseverance is the, is the first thing, and, uh, and to always do your best and to uh, work hard and not expect uh, anything in return for it other than the, to know you, ha you know you have done your best. And to realize that uh, the, the cases that we deal with belong to p the people. Uh, the, the, they need a resolution. They need a principled resolution in their case. I think it's uh, important that we consider 
what ripple effect uh, our decisions will have on the people in the, not only the people in this case, but in people in future cases. So I think that uh, that's been a, that's been an important lesson. But you know, treating people with dignity, uh, understand, and listening to people. Listening is a tremendous skill. Learn so much by listening. Mm -hmm. It's been a. I've been really, very very fortunate to have been chosen by the people to serve in these roles, and and I, I'm humbled by it. So you'll be retiring soon. I will. <laughs> I will. What legacy do you hope to leave? Well, I hope to leave a legacy of, of kindness, of integrity, and that uh, I've, if I maybe have made the road, uh, the door a little wider open for uh, people that are qualified to be considered for very important positions. Uh, I hope I'm known that I worked hard and did my best and that I gave it my all. Mm -hmm.